welcome to our Driftless Dialogue. Uh, my name is Maggie. I am the education coordinator here at the KVR. And we're celebrating Earth Day with a talk about invasives today. So I want to welcome our speaker, Matt Walrath. He is, the, he is a conservationist with the Upper Sugar River Watershed Association. Um, so he has been working on ecological work for a long time. He did um, environmental wetland habitat restoration in the Pacific Northwest. He was a crew supervisor with the Washington State Department of Ecology. Um, he worked on Orcas, Orcas? Or Orcas, Island, yeah. Orcas Island in the Salish Sea, teaching outdoor education and then also owned and operated a landsca landscape company. Um, he also helped found the Orcas Island Youth Conservation Corps and served in as an appointed commissioner for the San Juan County Land Bank. Um, he's back in Wisconsin where he's originally from and um, has a master's in environmental conservation, um, he's most recently worked as the statewide organisms in trade outreach coordinator and regulation specialist for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And we're very excited to have him here. Today he's going to be talking to us about um, organisms on the move, citizen science via Project RED, techniques for river monitoring, and the current rules in the state of Wisconsin. So we're very excited. So please welcome Matt. Thank you. Thanks, all. Thanks for having me. Happy Earth Day. Um, I am repping my Nelson Institute because you know that we are the founders of Earth Day here in Wisconsin. So Gaylord Nelson, so I'm a, that's where I got my master's degree and awesome, awesome guy, uh, known to get stuff done across the aisle, often at the bar. So, you know, something that's very Wisconsin of him and get to meet his, his uh, daughter Tia, who's really awesome. I, I just had a Nelson Institute event and honoring his legacy. So. Um, proud to be here talking, talking um, about the environment. So invasive species, you know, we're going to go through, I'm not, so I currently work for Upper Sugar River Watershed Association, which I will call Upper Sugar because is, I can say it very fast, but it's still a mouthful. And I'm also uh, part of the South Central Invasive Partnership, which serves, I'm on council for that. So kind of educational events around these things, um, kind of in the Driftless area. We don't actually include Vernon County, but I, I work here. Um, and I'll kind of explain my overall job, who I am, and get into the invasive species. And if you guys have questions, ask them whenever. Um, or also maybe, you know, I can even bring the mic over to you so we're making a recording of this for the Thriftless Dialogue. Um, so, um, yep, I am the program manager. Uh, so here's what we're doing currently at Urshua. It's a really useless acronym as well. Um, but uh, Upper Sugar, so we've been around since uh, 2001. and was formed out of a need to keep the water in Badger Mill Creek in the watershed and it's an advisory group and it became a whole nonprofit structure. Originally it was kind of more paddle focused. And we have kind of a cool logo, if you can see over here, it's, it's, a, it's nice, oh yeah, I guess that doesn't really work. But the, the logo is, you know, it's, it's got a paddle, it's got some fish, it's got some oaks and you know, it's, it's a very, it's, um, it's, it's Verona down to like Belleville. So it's very in kind of Southwest Dane County. Pretty affluent, um, but really kind of beautiful as well. And so, you know, I do lots of tabling events. Um, I continue doing the organisms and trade stuff, which is to go talk to Habitatitude messaging, saying don't dump your cute turtle in the river. You know, that we can rehome them now, which is really cool. Um, we have a um, Farmers for the Upper Sugar uh, River Association. So they're a really cool a group of people that they're all, it's farmer led. We have like 40 plus farmer producers that actually you know, take these conservation efforts to reduce phosphorus loading and to do no-till stuff and, and buffer planting. And we're really quite proud of that. And we're also a project group. We really have a lot of um, great volunteers that do, you know, we're very mighty for being like about three full-time equivalents of staff because we have volunteers and a volunteer board and they really kick butt. And one of our guys, uh, Robert Bohanan, is just an incredible um, teacher and ecologist from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Now retired, but he's our board president. He's like a half staff by himself. So, and I do signage. If you see signs around that say Stop Aquatic Kit Checkers, I'll go into this much more in depth at booth bar stations and whatnot. We're always looking to put more of those out as needed without being annoying. I know when I first got this job, Marcy was like, no more signs, we have plenty of signs. Um, and also, I love the KBR. I'm really proud to be here just because I think it's a really cool organization. I used to work with Ben Johnson a bunch, if you know him. He's a, he's a really awesome invasive yeah, species right. guy. Yeah, right. <laughs> as well as, well as, as uh, yeah, and he's a friend of mine too. And so him and Gina let me sleep on their floor when I come up here sometimes. So uh, we're very frugal that way. You know, as much as I should go get to the motel, I'd rather hang out with my friends and, and their dogs. Um, so that's kind of who we are. Um, doing uh, detection and, you know, the, talking to this group, this is your opinion leaders that I'd love to empower to do more reporting and work, um, kind of report 
things that are maybe new to the area and also kind of to keep an eye on some menaces that we'll get into. So, you know, there's me down in the bottom left corner. So this is, I started a youth conserva you know, conservation corps back in the day, but I also uh, was an AmeriCorps and a Washington Conservation Corps member. Um, this is my friends doing gorse busters who were out at a resort and we didn't really pay, they paid me a little bit, but they basically got paid in like sauna time and like, and like cabins we had, and, and a discount at the cafe. And we had a great time. Something I started because when I was a winter intern out there trying to kill all this uh, Mediterranean gorse, which is, which is super, uh, it's super prickly, it's nasty. I was one man wading into, like I was a woofer wading into, you know, willing worker on organic farms into this huge thing. And I was like, wait a minute, I have all these friends in Seattle that are professional landscapers. So if I can Tom Sawyer them out here, we're gonna get a lot more done. And so we did for like 10 years and kind of declared victory, but they want us back because of course it always comes back. It's, um, I'm of the line of Wisconsin. I'm a triple double badger. So um, I have two degrees. I'm, I have a biology BS um, in 2004 and an environmental conservation master's in 2018. My folks met at Wisconsin-Madison um, as a landscape architect and a pharmacist. And so I, from a young child, I always had to get my my um, allowance by like moving mulch and mowing the lawn. And so I'm born landscaper and the smell of always flowers and something sharp and, and accurate always ran to me and my mom will hang out at the nurseries and I only until when I was like in my 20s, I was like, pesticides and fertilizer reminds me of my mom for sure. <laughs> so, cause Hawks nurse, that just was her life. She was a staff uh, landscape architect and also a teacher. So, and my grandma um, who passed away at the age of 90, she got a degree in conservation in 1950 uh, with minor in botany and studied with Leopold in his classes and in fact was on his roster when he passed away. And so she was, I'm the oldest grandson and very much the closest to the tree on all of that. She always had the keep it country sticker on her Geo Metro and college of cranes and wood depression era stuff so she could, you know, weave all the boys shirts into, into rugs and was a terrible cook, but a great baker because she would never waste any food. So we'd show up and she'd be like, yeah, I made some rice last night and like didn't turn out but kind of gelatinous, but it's, I made some soup out of that, put some old ham bones in there. And we're like, thanks grandma. And it's just, you know, and we're, this is like, like German Polish level of spice, which is none. Like, you know, pepper is considered spicy. And, but, and usually that was fine because she could bake us a really awesome cinnamon roll or something. But that night she went into the fifties, better living through chemistry. And she made yellow, disgusting looking lemon jello with carrot slices and sour cream on top. And that was dessert. And we were terrified. And we, me and my sister, we'd go out to the Jefferson farm and hang out with her on the weekends. It was like free babysitting. We loved it out there. But then we would beg our mom for Dairy Queen on the way back. We're like, we're starving. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, so yeah, you know, and my, I, I kind of finished up school in, um, in uh, good old Wisconsin in 2004 and kind of have that like, go west young man thing in me. And so I did. And Explored California and Washington and lived in Washington State for a long time. That's my business while we're at Fruit and Forest. I specialize in organic care and um, orchard work. So I, I love that, doing that. Great place for that. And then I did help. I actually designed that logo and made the font. And I renamed it. It was the Orcas Youth Conservation Corps, but that's also OYCC, which is the Oregon Youth Conservation Corps. You don't want to compete for that IP. So we added the, and OI is like, OI till I die is what the kids out there say. So help that. Um, and I'm all, you can call me the commissioner too, because I was an appointed commissioner really cool program that we can learn from, but we'll probably never, never enact. So the San Juan County Land Bank, they in fact have 1% of all private sales goes into real estate excise tax and becomes the land bank. And so they have a lot of money. And if they sell a big house, that's $2 million every two years, don't care, get that money every time. And so they use that to purchase land and steward it, as well as with a, um, the San Juan Conservation Trust. There's, like a, there's another side of it. So that's, that's the, they can actually accept money because the county can't really accept money and you're culpable for all that. So really interesting model. It's citizen mandated, but every 12 years is up for elections. So one of the three or four of actual county public land banks in the, in the states. Um, and I could see Rokewood, you know, like this county doing it, but it's, you know, obviously politics. I'm not gonna talk politics. Um, yeah, so here I am doing my thing now and I spent some time with the DNR, but here I am on the auspices of the Upper Sugar. So I serve this area as uh, the designee of the Lake Monitoring and Protection Network, which is a really, uh, LMPN, it's hard to say because it's like the same LMNOP but kind of messed up. Um, but uh, anyways, um, so I would serve seven counties in the Driftless and for Vernon County, we contract with the um, Vernon County Conservation Department with the land and water. And so the money would go, th go through them, their committee would then assign it, they could take the money, but um, they, their staff has decided that with 
our services, we can do the core services, it's like $9,000. So that's a drop in a bucket for anybody versus having me on retainer kind of full time. And so I you know, spread my time out throughout the various counties that I serve, um, and I serve kind of the Southwest wedge um, of the state, not including Crawford and Richland. I used to, but I couldn't get any traction with them. I love Vernon County because you're passionate and there's volunteers and there's activity that I can, that I can add to and, and help facilitate. So that's why I'm still here. And I just, I have lots of friends uh, here too. Yes. Do you cover Juneau? I do not cover Juneau County. Nope. I go just as far as, and there's a map actually, I can show you later. Um, you can click on stuff and see who, who your responsibilities are. I think that's River Alliance and um, but you know what, I'm not gonna, I, I couldn't tell you, so. Um, <laughs> but here's my map. Um, so, you know, I cover, I, I include in this map, I include Grant and Vernon. So for this group, we do South Central Invasive Partnerships just for those five counties listed down there. You can kind of see where there are and are not uh, various SISMAs, so Cooperative Advanced Species Management Areas. I think that La Crosse, Vernon, and Crawford would be really well suited to set one up, but it's a whole process. So we can talk about more about that later if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Just because the, the people of the river and of the coolies are very different than, you know, the central driftless that I kind of serve. I mean, so, there's a lot of overlap, but it is the, the, the very tight and very just kind of focused on different things. So, um, so talking invasive species, um, I always like to ask, so what comes to mind for, for the room? Like, you know, so just raise your hand or popcorn. What's an invasive species? I mean, you guys, you're doing one today and this week, right? So garlic mustard. Garlic mustard. Okay. What else? Parsnip, yep. Well, parsnip. Um, anything else? What else? What are the other ones? Reed canary grass. Reed canary grass. Interesting. You know what? Reed canary grass is kind of uh, that's, or, that's interesting because there is a non-native type, but it's been here forever. It's just a thug, um, and because uh, like there's because there's pictures of of the natives using it in their in their weavings. I personally hate it, um, but because because it's just so aggressively uh, big. But there's, it's not actually listed as invasive species. There, it just, so this is why I'm gonna, this is, this is a lexicon thing. It's very important because you talk to conservationists that are like diehard prairie enthusiasts and they'll, they'll tell you that like red cedar and aspen are bad, okay? Now, those are native species, but they're saying these are invading my prairie. I would call those an aggressive native, not an invasive species. Because when I say that, I don't, we're not talking noxious weeds either. Now people kind of list, oh, they're noxious weeds or they're weeds. Those are different. Noxious weeds have a federal status and you can add those to a state, but it's very challenging and there's like eight of them. And so we at the, luckily here, we're forward thinking enough uh, in Wisconsin to have um, this delightful state statute. And this is the definition that, we, that I use and that we use at a state level when we talk about invasive species. So non-indigenous species and the real thing is environmental harm or harm to human health and economic harm. So that's, that's quite broad. Um, now, this is the question that I don't have an answer for and all the fifth graders love the debate. Are humans an invasive species? Absolutely. <laughs> Not according to the law, uh, because we write the laws. If you ask a beaver, they'd be like, yeah, I do. <laughs> I mean, beavers are interesting too, right? But, um, you know, so this is human-centric, obviously. Um, I like to use what the indigenous people say, which is they, they say um, non-local beings is how they address. And they don't call us white boys that, luckily. Um, but um, we're kind of grandfathered in because humans have been here for a very long time. Um, but it is something that I think about in, in my language and working in real places, you can even get racism caught up in this when I teach kids, you know, they, they have this weird twitch that goes one way or the other. It's, it's like, you know, so what I try to do is draw everybody in, like we're all humans, and now let's talk about what's out there. You know, um, in the process of making the rules, people have all kinds of ideas. So, what about feral cats? Are feral, cat, are feral cats an invasive species? Yeah. Yes, they are. But regulating them makes us look silly, so we don't do it. And because we have like an open comment period that say, okay, let's suggest what you know what we should regulate, and some of them are very specific, like. Kudzu must be on the list forever. You know, we can't take it off because it's bad in Florida. Humans are terrible. We should regulate. It's like, well, no, that's not how the rule works because um, there, you know, it has to be in the, certain categories for how we treat and kind of control them. And cats, if you were to make them restricted by the letter of the law, you could no longer um, sell or transport. You could possess them, but you couldn't sell or transport them. And if we piss off all the cat moms, then the DNR is ranked, you know, <laughs> lots of thumbs down on Facebook. Um, so, um, 
So it's talking about viable organisms. So it's called chapter NR40, and NR40, NR just means natural resources, and 40 is just the number that was up next. Doesn't mean anything as far as I, I wish it was 42, but that's just me. Um, so viable organisms is the really important uh, thing here. So if you get, um, there's this thing called water hyacinth that is prohibited, and it's a nasty floating plant, um, and it's, you know, if we see it, we eradicate it right away. But you can buy baskets from Thailand made of dried, um, water hyacinth um, because uh, it's dead. You know, if it's not viable, we're not worried about it. So if it can't, so if it can't have viable organisms, which is so, what makes it illegal actually to transport it around is if it's got roots that will establish, it's got seeds, if it can clone itself or whatever it is, or eggs in a lot of cases, then it becomes, um, you know, against the rules. And we really want to do. I was the regulation specialist for this rule for a while at the DNR and worked with um, business, businesses and said, hey, you got some illegal crayfish, what are we gonna do about it? You got these like snails in your things, you can't have these. So trying to work with them and then having them achieve compliance with a bark. And I was step zero. I was like, I'm not a warden. I know I look like a cop, but I'm not. Um, so like, um, you know, um, just do your best to come into compliance and we'll check on you in, a, in like a year and see if you managed to eradicate this or not. Um, so if you're doing your BMPs, your best management practices, you're not going to get a ticket. Very few tickets are written. Only if you're a real jerk to the inspectors and you're just a scoff law. And I did have to put a case down like that actually in Waukesha County. It was very important because they had a prohibited species, yellow floating heart, and it was growing in their pond and they weren't even selling it, but they were selling things from their pond out. So all the seeds were in there. They don't even know where it came from. And I, you know, it's a little bit of detective. I was like, I figured out that it was probably just like, pond cleaning company that was actually really responsible, but we couldn't pen anything, we couldn't prove anything, but they had the stuff. So I showed up, you know, and I had to get them to achieve compliance without going to the Department of Justice because they, we could refer them up, up the ladder. Um, however, that was in Waukesha County, and there was a good chance if we would it up on the ladder, the entire rule would be just thrown out as stupid by the Waukesha County judges. And that, that would put the entire uh, rule at risk. So I did achieve compliance of being very sweet, showing up every month, wearing Carhartts and a, deer, you know, you know, a John Deere hat. And the first time I walked in, I was like, hi, I'm here um, to, with the DNR. I'm doing just a little bit of um, inspecting. And I had my tag on my, they're like, oh, okay. And they're like, where's your pond? You know, can, you, can you show it to me and send me out a manager? And they're like, yeah, of course. And so I walked out and I'm looking, I'm seeing the, the flea all floating cart. And I hear the lady yell back, it's a sting. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I was like, oh golly. Um, but so I was just very persistent and nice about it. And they did eventually just pour concrete and make a new pond. Um, and so we achieved compliance um, and did not advance that beyond what already had like a warden meeting and it was, you know, they're going to have to lawyer up, but they're already scoff laws. They didn't pay their, their licenses. Anyways, it was a win, but it's, it's all bark, no bite. So don't, you know, get stressed out. It is against a lot of transport seeds and stuff, but if you're doing the best you can and cleaning your boots and stuff, it's not that big of a deal. I actually want to go back here to, um, this is a full taxa. So we're talking every single type of species, including wild boar, jumping worms, uh, snakehead carp, you know, all this kind of stuff. We think more of like, you know, thistles and multiflora rose and like, and like even longhorn beetles, which are more of an agricultural pest. Um, but it is, we're actually really, in, like the thing that causes white nose fun fungus in bats is, uh, is prohibited. So it's actually interesting how broad it is. And that's, that's we're pretty unique and forward thinking amongst many other states for that. Um, everyone's favorite friend here, right? You know, this, this stuff is, is uh, you see it out there everywhere on the sides and you know, wild parsnip, it's a parsnip, you could eat it. Um, but just don't touch it, get the sap on you because it does give you photosynthetic burns. And I've definitely had a few spots of this here and there and it sucks. Um, so, you know, that's a good one. That's obviously, you know, is it replacing high quality habitat? Kind of, but is it causing economic and, and human health? Definitely. Um, but so who is it in our ivory tower sitting around? And in fact, it's me. Um, I help facilitate and regulate the, the, the rulemaking process um, with various species assessment groups. But we also kind of go back to John Curtis's Vegetation in Wisconsin. And in this book, um, if you're not familiar with it, uh, there, there's the Curtis Parade, the Arboretum at Madison. It's really cool. Um, he did an ordination of all these different uh, communities to say, okay, red pines associate with red oak and here and here, but not here. And so the, he did that mostly from um, the Platt survey of when that was all kind of, when Wisconsin was being cut up into big squares, the Platt men would go out and they would drop a, a stake and then they would make a botanical assay of the area often to like locate the stake, but then with that data, it's pretty rich. 
to say what was actually here before um, the plow. Um, and, that's, and then we also have to use threat analysis for climate disruption, you know, popularity and landscaping trends and all that kind of stuff to make wise decisions. So, um, so we're going through regulatory categories. If it's orange, and you're, I'm gonna go through some slides. I'm not gonna do lots of ID stuff. I have a massive slide deck because I like to kind of get through stuff fast and we see where interest follows us. Um, anyways, if it's, if it's restricted, it's orange. And here are the, the qualifications. So this is like buckthorn and, and like bush honeysuckle, Eurasian water milfoil, purple loosestrife, um, you know, a wild parsnip. They are restricted because we, the genie's out of the bottle, we can't do anything about it, but we can still stop them. We don't want people selling buckthorn. I was working the Garden Expo um, at PBS on the Madison and I had someone from Illinois come up and says, we're gonna buy some, uh, some buckthorn. I was like, oh. like here's, my, here's my landscape alternative uh, flyer, sir. You know, and I was like, or just wait for the birds on the fence. It's, it's going to come anyways. But um, yeah, so, you know, and so that was commonly sold in the trade. And my mom is a landscape architect. I gave her the list and she's like, oh, no, I love burning bush. Why would you do this? Like, well, I'm like, mom, you didn't do anything wrong. Like, you didn't know that's restricted. It's in everybody's front yards. But does it get into the understory of, of um, various places and make a mess and make, you know, kind of uh, all compete our natives? It does, and that's why it's restricted, and that's why we have decided to curtail its sale. It's more complicated than that, too, because there are exempt cultivars of certain things. So barberries, in general, you can't buy because they suck. As a landscaper, they're the worst. They'll go through two pairs of leather gloves, like, into your knuckle. It's just, like, what they're good at. Um, but there's exempt barberries that have been bred for color and to be less vigorous, and therefore the industry uh, wanted some being like, look, if we put all this time and energy and you just make a blanket statement, that's not cool. In general, if we say the species on the list, it includes all varieties and subgroups and hybrids, basically, to some extent. But the hybrid stuff gets confusing. So if you, just, if you see a barberry, you don't have to necessarily freak out, but you can take a picture and you can snap it, send it to me, or you can get into the really awesome statuettes and start to read you know, the lawyer speak. But yeah. that's what I'm here for, I'm a resource. Um, now, if it's red, it is prohibited. Um, and these are the things we think we can keep a cap on or they're so bad that we never want to see them. So kudzu's on the list. Kudzu is not viable here yet, right? But we don't want it to show up, right? So lots of early detection species make it to that list that we know are complete bullies other places and we say, nah. Um, and then, and then it's, things are also split listed just to make it even more confusing. So here in Vernon County, Japanese hops is a real problem along the sides of the river but it's restricted here, it's prohibited outside the drift list because they don't really have it, but here it's only restricted. And the state uses information for funding priorities um, and like grant making and overall kind of like work planning. So it is, the status is important. We'll have a new version probably like 2026. We've been working on it for many years and COVID did not make that easier. Um, but what's different about this is the possess line. So you can't have this legally in your yard. Now you're gonna get a ticket, no. Um, but you know, that's the thing is if you, could, if you have all these old kind of grandfathered and things, we say, well, yeah, we love if you could eradicate them. We encourage you to, not mandated, but they kind of kick up the, kick up the status or prohibited stuff. So, you know, re um, this is Phragmites, you know, and so it's all about cleaning your gear off. And if, if there's anything I could, I could tell you, especially as, as a, a people that I say, you have a boot brush station out there. You guys run a great organization here in Vernon County. has got a lot of tourism encouraging people to clean their boots off and giving them a boot brush or whatever is like the simplest and most important step because once it's established in the waters, there's not much we can do about it, but we can do some prevention. So you just clean your blade off versus having to wade into 16 foot tall grass in a wetland, you know, it's not easy. Um, uh, that's something else. Okay, so this is all the ID stuff. I'm not gonna get into this very much because I'm gonna assume you guys are kind of, we're at like, at like you know, this is like a 365 uh, level class, I think, or, you know, whatever. So, um, you know, I'm going to go through and obviously this, these are some of the most common things that we see. What you'll notice is their status up there, and that might be a little interesting, but, you know, you see garlic mustard everywhere. The buckthorns, you know, they're, they're everywhere. Um, you know, this is a wisp tip viewer. Um, they do look a lot like our cherries, but one thing that's important is that they tend to have that little spike at the end. Um, on the, of their buds. That's a nice little uh, identifi identification factor. And they also have this nasty like yeah, yellow orange rush, rust on their leaves. It makes them easier to spot. Just restricted. Everyone's favorite bush honeysuckle. It's beautiful. I know it would have flowers and it's nice. Um, and I've had many, 
I've had lots of old gardener uh, people be like, well, should we just leave some honeysuckle in the yard for the birds? And I'm like, the birds have been here for 10,000 years, and honeysuckle's been here for about 100, so no. Um, I also, though, I'm a little controversial because I know we're not supposed to mow for ground nesting bird season in the sides of roads, and that's really important, but it was all just super nasty invasives. That's not habitat either, and so it's kind of an interesting decision I mean, you have to follow the rules, you're not allowed to, look to mow on roadsides, but I, I kind of question that. I mean, you have to make some decisions, the management decisions to control this stuff. Um, yeah, they're pretty, and there's lots of them. Um, there are also uh, vine versions uh, that we have, a, we do have a native vine honeysuckle here, but um, these are all the bush ones. This one's actually new and rising in the area, and I do want to look over this one a little bit, because I, I know it's at Koshkanong Park, which is, on the, which is a, a wild county park on the far east side of Vernon County. And it's really creeping up. It really loves the duffy kind of undersoil from like pine plantations that you'll see all over the place, kind of from the, like the old silviculture days. And it, it can be a nasty um, thing that comes up. And they look like little oak leaves kind of to start, but they have this bright yellow flower. Um, and I, I took this picture and that's all just, this is just the base of Koskanong and it's just like all full of this stuff. So it really, you know, it sets out early. And that's often a thing about invasive species is they, you'll, when you drive along the sides of the highways, you can see all the honeysuckle because it's all turning green and nothing else is wet yet. So, you know, it's that, it's usually coming from a place that it's, it's winter hardy, but it's willing to, to, to hedge its bets and put out its leaves before the oaks. Oaks are like, yeah, it's snowing today, guys. Like, I'll, I'll do some bud expansion, but like, don't get wild, you know? Um, so, um, yeah, so this is one to look out for. Um, and it has a very distinctive yellow, roots and a yellow sap, like a little latex that pops out of it if you snap it, so you, it's hard to get it wrong. Um, and it is only um, restricted, um, but I, it's one of those things, stitch in time. So I love bluegrass music, and I go out to the Driftless Music Gardens, and I volunteer out there, and in fact, one of the things I do is I just comb the sides of their hills and kill a base of species for them. And I found one, one of these, and I took it and I showed it to the land manager. He's like, we got this one, that means there's probably more seeds but let's, because they have all this pine, it's like, let's not let this get established. So kind of on the, on the rise in this area. Also Japanese hedge parsley too. Um, it just looks like all the other parsleys. It has parsley looking leaves, but it's a carrot and it's just kind of on the rise. I'm also doing this, there's, so there's different tools here. So this is the Minnesota wildflowers. This, these guys, this is from the DNR page. So they have all the things that are, are regulated, have their own page. Um, I actually prefer the language and the fonts of Minnesota wildflowers. Um, it's just kind of a different, I like the zoomed in looks. So tons of different resources out there for how to do this stuff. I'm going through a few of them. I also really like Wisconsin Wildflowers, um, which is a cool app on your phone. It has a nice key on it um, from foreign based and native stuff. And you can kind of actually even dive into like what kind of purple aster is this? There is like one of like 15. People ask me, what's this? I'm like, that's a purple aster. So <laughs> yeah. the name of that app? Uh, it's, uh, Wisconsin. it's Wisconsin Wildflowers, yep. Yep, that's a really good one. Um, and I, and I, yeah, I'll go into some other apps later too. So, um, All right, poison hemlock on the rise out here too. If you've not seen this stuff, it is kind of moving. It's another one of the carrots. Um, has that parsley looking leaf. It has its very distinct speckling on it. And then this stuff is very poisonous. We're talking three years on silage and it can still kill a cow. Um, the seeds in particular are very poisonous. And it was what was used to kill uh, uh, Socrates, uh, Socrates for some reason, so it's ancient, it's from the old, from the old world, but deep-rooted, comes along the roadsides, comes along the riverbeds, and you don't want it because it also gets really bad burns, just like parsnip does. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you can see the kind of this mounding, as if like it's the most giant Bloody Mary you've ever seen um, with like celery stalks. Um, and then they have the reddish stems and like, and like the kind of purpley spots. Now we do have a native version, but the, their stems are almost all purple. It's called swamp, uh, swamp hemlock. So, you know, not always bad, but when, if you see it, you might want to note it, because it, and it has those kind of like umble flowers, kind of umbrella tops. Um, and uh, yeah, it's on the rise down in, down in the Driftless area. I, don't, I haven't seen much of it around here. I want to keep it that way. Um, yeah, you can see it gets really tall too, and it loves, it loves trout streams, so it sucks. Um, this is a real thug for us. Um, and it, what sucks is that you cannot make beer out of it. Um, it like, cause, <laughs> Because um, it would be much less of a problem if, it, if people could, would harvest it, right? Um, but you'll see this stuff, it, it, they call it water hemp, and it looks like hemp. 
It's in the same family, but it has this little twining vine that goes everywhere, and then it makes, it's semi-annual, because if it's a nice spot, it can get established and actually become perennial. It, but it sends up hemp, like strands, that have these nasty teeth on them. So it's a problem. I uh, definitely want to report it. You can see it's mostly down in our part of the country. So, you know. And the goats don't like it. It's so prickly. And that's what's sad. Yeah. Um, there's porcelain berry in Viroqua, right at the Waldorf School, um, that they put on a fence line. It's prohibited. Um, and it's been there forever. And so I'm working with them to eradicate it and put up some like grapevine or something. But you'll see this around. It's got really beautiful kind of these little peppery berries. They have these little like, they look like little Easter bunny treats. Uh, so differences between the grapes and the porcelain berries. Um, Again, I'm kind of blasting through this because I'll share this with you all and you can like dissolve it on your own time. So is wild grape native or? Wild grape is native, yes. You have a lot of it here in the, in the Kickapoo Valley Reserve. Oh, I've just spent a lot of right. time trying to get rid of it. That's fair. I mean, that's the thing. So I'm, I'm not zealous about this and like my, my uncle owns some property down in Crawford County. He hates wild grape because he can't take his UTV year out with it. You know, so then he's like, oh, I've been killing that stuff. Let's take him. I'm like, Unk, that stuff's fine, but like I respect your decision. You know, you want to be able to hunt turkey here. That's what that's the, the land use. So you know, it's always it's always you have to find that that balance. Um, but uh, yeah, wild grapes also to, you can make a nice jam out of it, right? Um, getting the aquatic world, you know, this is one of the most common things you're going to see, and we do have it in a lot of lakes around here. Um, it's just it's, you know, it just makes these big mats, and it does tons of like growth. Uh, that will cut off oxygen and make it, you know, it's not the best, but it has die off, stuff like that, so. Um, with another, another restricted thing, I know it's in um, Curly Leaf Pondweed too, is up in Sidey Hollow, or uh, yeah, some of, the, some of the lakes around here. This is a common one that you'll see in the, in the river, um, Curly Leaf Pondweed, it's, it's really ubiquitous in Wisconsin rivers, pretty much. Um, it's, uh, it has lasagna noodle, uh, wavy lasagna noodle looking leaves, and that's how you can tell. It's the only one that has, and they have these little spikes and they're quite rigid. Um, it's interesting that what it does is it makes a turian, which is on the top of it, which is like this interesting like reverse root structure. So it's the top, but then it breaks off and it looks like a little like, like kind of Christmas tree and it goes to the bottom, but it with like kind of fronds, but it goes to the bottom, it can rest there over winter and, and move around on boats and that's how it, it then vegetatively spreads. So it does make seeds, but mostly it's clones itself. Yeah? Just ponds or ponds and trout streams? Uh, ponds, yeah, I'd, I'd say, you know, pond weed is kind of, that's a, more like a, like a classification, definitely trout streams. We have, like, we have in the Sugar River, I've seen it here and there, it's pretty common. Um, and again, it's just, you know, it makes these thick mats and out competes our native stuff and we don't like it. The fish don't mind it sometimes, but it, there's a certain threshold for it. Um, now, this is a, a great one to say that we do not have yet that I know of in the county, but is a serious problem. Uh, New Zealand mud snails. These things, okay, you have to think that those are millimeters on the bottom left, and there's not the size of an ice cream cone, you know, or like this, this, this dime over here. It's the size of a grain of rice, and they, and they match their dirt color because that's what they eat that's in the river, so they're from like brown to black uh, to kind of khaki. Um, they are uh, born pregnant. They clone themselves. There's only one clone that we know of, and so that means that one of them, all it takes is one of them to become full size, have more babies. And they can, one New Zealand mudsnail can have 200,000 generational offsprings in, this, in a growing season. Um, and they, they eat, they're the tritivores, so they go along the bottom and they eat the same kind of stuff that our native snails and crayfish would eat. Um, they're, and also they're microscopic when they're, when they're villagers, when they're really small. So they're really easy to move around. Um, who wants to guess where they originate? Hey, very good. Um, yes, and so, and, but they, what they're doing is they're following around the trout streams because they can live, most things can only live for like four or five days out of water. These guys, they're percolating their trap door, they close it off, 28 days out of water. Um, and bleach doesn't kill them. 409, for some reason, kills them. The best thing to do, though, is just use a waiter wash station and a brush, clean off your tools. What you cannot do is you cannot use felt sole waders. We really I encourage everyone to get away from those. Those things never dry, and they're just like villager heaven. The little guys love to crawl up in there, um, and they get thick as thieves. And you know, so if you know you're going to some place, make sure you clean your boots off. Um, it's also something, in general, whenever you're doing restoration or even fishing, if you can work from top waters down to down, you know, instead of from bottom to top for for a stream or a, uh, you know a water body, 
the, the chances that the headwaters have invasives is much lower than with the confluence with a bunch of other things. So that's how I do my monitoring. I, then I bring a bunch of clean sets of gear and steam clean my stuff and do all kinds of things to make sure I don't spread it. Because I could be the, the, the nemesis. I, I go to all the prohibited sites, I do all the stuff, I make all the records, I have baggies full of weeds. That's right, baggies full of weeds. Um, that I, I'm already, always in my car, so I vacuum a lot. And, uh, you know, so it's, um, anyways, I, as an expert on these things, want to make sure that I am not also the problem. Um, and it can be hard if you've recreated your whole life and you like having mud between your toes. I get it, you know. But you tell old timers to clean their boat off, they're like, my grandpa never cleaned the boat off before we hitched it back up to the cabin. It's like, well, your grandpa didn't have these like 15 different races species that now infest all of our lakes. And you probably don't have them in your lake up north. So, you know, that's a big part of clean boats, clean waters, you call that, and that's a whole program statewide. Yeah. How are you gonna control these teeny tiny things in Can't. I mean, they did, Montana, they did a nuke, where they nuked part of a river where they got in there. Didn't really matter. Um, they are, because they're clones, they are susceptible to occasional viral, viral outbreaks and like, and like collapses that we don't understand, but they're definitely, you know, the, 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 real, the real answer is, do your best to show up with clean gear, you know, and follow the protocols, especially if you know you're in an area that has them, to not transport them to another, another water body. So, you know, arrive with clean gear, clean your gear before you go and when you get home. And clean gear is a happy gear, you know, it's like it's better for your gear anyways. You can freeze stuff, you can steam it, you can just, you can wait 30 days, you know, and that, this is kind of the worst as far as spreading things on accident because they just, they're so dang hardy. Um, Yep, this is, I'm showing this a couple times. Inspect, drain, scrub, rinse. Um, and we're actually, uh, we got a grant around these issues, which is fun with us and um, Rock River Coalition. So we're gonna be making decon kits to give to angler shops that you can basically check out when you go as a, you know, when you go on a trip, you know, maybe you're renting some gear, getting some information, tackle box with some 409, a boot brush, some prompts. So we're hoping that can help. Um, we don't have any, any known spots. And they also need cold water and the right mineral concentration too. They need kind of high calcium. So some places don't, aren't really conductive to them. And that's a water quality thing as well. Um, but we'd rather just do the prevention. Like this is our star volunteer making blue brush stations. Um, now this is a resource I can share too as far as how to talk about rights of way. I mean that's a really important uh, and, and a, a very serious factor for these kind of things. Um, and mowing, you know, and so not weeds and not intermites, you can't kill them, all you do is spread them. But then like wild parsnip, especially if you do it at the right time, and if you see there's, uh, I'll actually show you another slide. Um, if you can get them when they set their second set of embols. So they grow up and they got, you know, they, so they start as a, ro a rosette. So that on the upper left hand corner, that's the first year. It looks like those kind of big honking serrated kind of carrot leaves. And then second year is when it sends up a flowering stalk. So that's the top umble, which is that that flock kind of like wild, wild uh, what, Queen Anne's lace, you know, carrot top. Once it sets the secondary umbles from the, the, the sides, um, like the little teeny ones coming off the second, at that point it has decided that it is going to make seeds. And if you cut it at that point, it will not make seeds. You cut it beforehand, it'll just grow another stalk. If you cut it after, it's got seeds on it, you're just spreading it everywhere. So there's a very small window, usually in like June, but it's perfect timing. Oh, you can also get a parsnip predator, you can just snap it off right below the, um, the, the like about an inch below the, the soil level, and then just that'll actually strangle it because it, it cuts off the, the roots from the, from the plant. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a serious threat. And so um, this is a resource I can share by email. Just there's a PDF you can share with your, with your land managers because we've got a lot of stuff in here, you know, as far as um, what it looks like, how to check it out. These are, these are all restricted. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. uh, we use the person predator to yep. get stuff and then we bag it and mm -hmm. um, whatnot. But I don't do it just in June. Sure, that's fine. That's our okay. Yeah, especially yeah, if you can pull it and get it, get the roots out. It's just the timing is important for parsnip predator is good because you're kind of you're, you're killing it effectively at that point. If you're the thing is you can get by away with just mowing it because if you do it at the right time and, and repeatedly, there's gonna be a seed bank there too. So it takes a few years. Um, yeah, uh, teasel, we don't have out here a lot, but it's, this, this is kind of nasty stuff. Again, this mowing this works actually really well, um, but it just has to be kind of in the right time. Um, purple loosestrife, we do, is on the rise in this area. You probably see it in, we have a biocontrol program that I've been running here. So we, I did a biocontrol release last year in Chaseburg, which we have these little garicella beetles that are from uh, Europe, from whence, it, from whence the, the plant came. 
And um, what's cool is that you can um, basically, you know, so a lot of invasive species, the reason they do so well here is they didn't bring their, their nemesis with them from the old country, okay? So nothing here knows how to eat them quite yet or use them fully, so they're, they escape predation. And that means as the more they take over, the more our native stuff eats the native stuff because that's what they're good at. So biocontrol, you're bringing back a nemesis from the old world or whatever it is. Um, this is the same reason that you can grow coffee really, really well in, the, in like South America, and you can grow chocolate really, really well in Africa. They're, they're the same climate but from different places, and so the disease and insect pressure is way, way less. Of course, that's catching up, but it's the same idea. So we raise them and you rear them and you release them, and it's pretty fun. They, they make them into skeletons, and they won't kill them. Um, what they'll do is they'll take them from like a seven-foot tall stock with two million seeds to like a three-foot stock with a couple thousand seeds. Um, and then our natives have a chance to kind of catch up. Um, Chaseburg has got a very impressive collection in their wetland. Uh, so we're hoping that goes away. So here's us kind of making a cage, raising some beetles. Um, and then you come, out, you come out and you actually, what you do is you take them, you twine them around the healthy plant so that the larva can crawl over there. It's, it's actually really fun. Kids love it too. It's very kind of charismatic. Um, knotweed, I hate. We're, it's on the riser on here and I say, I say nay. I say stay in your place, knotweed. Um, you might recognize, uh, you know, there, it comes in acre-wise, acres, and you know, there's areas around here. It's a clone, so it doesn't really um, necessarily set much seed that's viable. That's Japanese knotweed, but our, our, um, our, uh, our hybridization is occurring, and so seeds are becoming viable, and they're becoming more reproductive. This stuff is considered hazardous living waste in the UK, they'll put a lien on your property because it's so hard to control once it's established. So if you see a small chunk of it, what it likes to do is bound around on rivers. So it sends these uh, rhizomes out, its roots, and then the roots don't have filamentous root hairs. So most things have these little tendrils that when you pull up you know, a, a little cedar start, it has this big invisible hanging ball of dirt, right? Knotweed does not do this, so it encourages erosion, which is really bad around here, and then it, the, the chunks go whoop, and they go whoop, and they, next they find a bridge, and then you have a whole new infestation. So it's, and it's, a, it's a real hardy plant to kill. It takes a lot of time and effort. So small populations do the best you can before they become an acre, you know. Um, and yeah, you got these kind of showy flowers. Um, that's what it looks like underneath the ground. It's just like catacombs and stuff, but it doesn't hold the soil. So that's, that's a kind of misconception. People are like, well, I mean, it's, some, it's, grow, it's green, it's growing, right? That's good. It's like, no. Uh, so uh, and I'm gonna blast through this quick, really quickly. I'm doing a genetic study that, on your behalf of the state, but you can actually submit stuff. And so piercing knotweed also, it comes up through the ground. It'll, it'll pierce through, uh, I, wanna, that's what, I wanna rename it piercing because right now it's Japanese and Bohemian. Try to move away from racial names from as a species because it's not very nice. And I think piercing is threat level because it'll go through the side of a foundation. Um, it'll go through asphalt. You can't bury it. It goes 30 feet in all directions. It's a damage type in Dungeons and Dragons, so you need to get people's attention with that. Yeah, it's piercing. Um, this is my dad on a bike trail. I mean, it's really, and he's 6'4", so stuff's a real problem. Um, yeah, right. Well, and so, you know, Frank, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright liked it, and he has stained glass of it, and he planted it around Taliesin. And this is before it was illegal. You know, I mean, we learn, right? It's adaptive management, we learn. Um, so there's a study that we can do, but I'm not gonna get into this very much, that I'm running it's a, uh, through service water grants. Um, just to, we're trying to figure out what's actually, because the issue is, is that, um, if you look, check this out, the Japanese, um, what we call that, I was taught that basically, if you see this large thing, it's Japanese knotweed. It turns out it's mostly actually bohemian, but you can't tell them apart just by the leaf shape or anything. Look at this line between Wisconsin and Minnesota. Now, do you think there's that difference of actual occurrences of bohemian versus Japanese, or are we just calling everything here Japanese? And I, our hypothesis is the second, and our genetics are showing that to be true. Um, and we're also, it should be called Renutria now, so I know it's always, it's taxonomy is a pain. Um, anyway, so, this is like the actual hybrid situation with giant and Japanese crossing. And now there's like five different hybrids and you can't tell which one's which. Um, and they're all bad. And you treat them more or less the same. But what's really, um, what's really important is, and here's like the, you know, we do a simple leafly analysis kind of for chloroplasts, it's easy to tell which one's which. We're gonna do it actually more advanced this time with a lab in Australia, full of genetic sequencing. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, this is the protocol. It's going to blast through all this. Um, soil types, and you know, you can see this is up in this is up in uh, you know, up in, our, in the Cooley country, and it's setting seed now. And so, you know, we thought we thought of it as a male sterile cultivar, but it's actually not. Yes. So, if it's a restricted species like garlic mustard, mm -hmm. I mean, there's still programs for garlic mustard eradication, right? right? Yep. So. But when it's prohibited, does that mean you, it's just in a whole different uh, category so that it, you can't transport it? And if you're found transporting it, you're... If you are doing, it says explicitly in the law, in R40, that if you are doing best manager practices and for eradication, you are fine. So as long as you're disposing of things properly, it's actually encouraged. And most landfills will still take stuff um, I, this stuff's best if burned because then it can't go nowhere. Um, cause it, it, there are cases of it actually breaking through like landfill clay barriers and like doing crazy stuff. Um, yeah. So, um, if you're, if, if you're under control, you're basically, you're, you're exempt from the rule. Um, you can also get permits for stuff. I have to get permits to do the, the purple loose dry stuff because I'm moving them around. Um, you know, but, um, generally, and generally speaking, again, don't, what shrundies if the if moving stuff around if you're doing best practices no one's gonna really care we would rather you do it you know but don't burn garlic mustard right uh, I I don't know that, that's one you can throw away um, and then there's some arsenic in it so you can make pesto out of it but you only want to eat a ton of it you should make pesto out of you know uh, metal that's really the best um, anyways so that's ongoing science and this is my various projects uh, non native phragmites we have a little bit along the waterway it's bad stuff. Um, okay, so I want to get through all this and remind you to do all this and kind of get a little bit of reporting and mapping stuff because I kind of talked, I got long-winded on my ID things. Um, I'm not going to go through this. This is my buddy, Jason, who does, this, we're good friends. People confuse us often, I don't know why. Um, but um, so there, he's talking about, these are all different ways that you can look at these things and we're going to talk about ad maps in particular, but um, SWIMS is the DNR's version. Gleden is now basically ad maps. Um, and there's other resources here. Um, these are just his slides from another thing. So I'm not actually going to go through this very much. But these are our records, though. There's a lot of records, but we're very underreported. So whatever we can do to get more people to putting these things into the system, the better. Uh, all right. Let's go through this. Yeah. He's got cool tools. He's a data guy. Uh, this is us looking at some Japanese hedge parsley out in the, out in the woods. OK, so Ed Maps. I want to get through this, and then I'm going to talk Project Red, and that's about what I got time for, and have time for questions, too. Um, so, if you guys are on the internets here, at, if you got your Wi-Fi going, you know, you can in fact pull this up right now. You're going to have to register for an account, but I'm going to show you the utility of it. What's the best thing about this, there's Edmaps and there's Edmaps Pro. They're not very huge apps for your phone. You can get both of them. For the, everything is free. Um, Edmaps is more your beginning level, like they have ID stuff, um, they have easy reporting, they've got maps and monitoring. Edmaps Pro you can make available offline which is very key for this part of the world because there's no guarantee you're going to have a cell phone service or a Wi-Fi uh, in, the, in, the back, in the back 40. And they're both free? They're both, everything's free. Yep, this is also sponsored by um, the uh, University of Georgia. They call it Bugwoods. And so they're, they got federal, a lot of federal money to um, support these apps. And they're, they're kind of growing all the time. Really neat stuff. So the Edmaps app online will sync up to your, uh, your phone and versus, you make an account. I encourage people to make individual accounts and not like a KVR account because I, I, I'm actually one of the persons that does the verification. I want to see who did it because if I know you're a good botanist and I look at the picture, I'm like, yeah. If I, if I don't know who you are and there's no picture, I ain't going to follow up. You know, so it's that level of detail to me. And then you can also look up track records by, um, by like who observer. So if I want to look up my name, you can see everything I've ever reported. And it's great for data management too. And because it makes a stable link, you can then share that across municipalities with pictures, location, you can draw polygons, really neat stuff. Um, so what the, the form looks like, you know, you, you pick your stuff, you pick your, your dates, your areas, kind of your, the habitat cover. Um, what's awesome is that you can then, on your phone, you can draw that polygon or on your computer, and that is super valuable. Because if, if someone says, oh yeah, I saw a patch of yada yada out by, you know, well, off the side of 14 by the barn, you're like, okay, great. You know, you can drop a pin, but that pin's not very accurate. It doesn't tell you the actual infestation size. Um, so that's very useful stuff. Um, then once things are verified, 
they get reviewed and made public, and then it makes this permanent record and a permanent link to that record. You can then do revisit reports for if you do pesticide application, um, if, you, if you dig it up and destroy it. Um, and it's, it's really easy, fun citizen science. And you can, so you can go crazy making every single gar garlic mustard stand, or you can just draw one big polygon. Um, and that's kind of what I prefer. Um, so uh, yeah, and so app, they will work, work well on Apple and uh, Android uh, pretty ubiquitously. Now, you're going to see Edmaps is kind of the beginner entry because they have distribution maps of that species, and then they have um, even ID components, so like flower pictures and all the kind of stuff, leaves and descriptions and botanical things. Edmaps Pro doesn't have any of that, but this is the one it takes a bit more time to set up, um, and I'm happy to do like consulting or even run. I, I have, there's some, lots of resources online, but if you want more help with this, this is what I do. Um, so you can get your county set up and downloaded, and then you have your offline maps. It shows you all occurrences, and it makes it much easier to add stuff. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, so this is Edmaps, this not pro, but you can see these, these, you know, this is like the images, how you report. And if you're standing there in the field and you can do it, it's just, instead of having a thing to go back to the office, you're looking at the barn and you're like, it's right there, you know, and it's pretty cool. Um, Edmaps Pro, you do have to set up your counties, and it, it's a little more complicated. Um, again, but there's, there's, re there's tools and trainings on the edmaps.org site that's pretty easy to get to. Um, this is also another really, really cool tool I want to share. The, um, this is a, uh, I, if you want to do observations but you're not sure when, um, this has, this is, um, has like occurrences. So what you can see here is that these life stages are going to be in color and then the detectability is over there on the side. So if you're looking for something, you know, if I was looking for gout weed in March, I would not have any luck. But if I'm looking for uh, common barberry, and when its leaves are changing color in October, bada bang, there it is. So it's, it's a neat tool, and you can kind of set your filters. Um, and again, that's uh, uh, this first detectors network, um, which, full disclosure, I'm, this is going to be my new job. I'm actually moving on from my current job, and I'm going to be running this program. So um, pretty excited about that. Uh, I'm not going to do anything live, because it's operating without a net, and you never know what's going to happen. Um, Okay, uh, no, this is, this is something completely different. Um, what I want to do actually now is kind of zip into, um, this is on the rise, the red hailstone, kind of interesting stuff. I get to go canoeing and detect it, which is winning for me. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to leave this up here, and then I'm going to get another, I'm going to go quickly what Project Red is. Um, Project Red is, is, is an act, this is kind of a volunteer ask, it's something that you guys could do at the, at the um, reserve. Um, it's citizen science. It's supported by UW Extensions. My friend Emily Heald runs the program, and it's a very simple protocol to do um, to do like stream monitoring. And you pick you pick a site that you like, and then you're just consistent. It's part of the Water Action Volunteers program. I don't know if you guys have Wave Volunteers to work out of here. You're one, great. So that's Emily and Katie. They run that program now, and so they're kind of adding this on as a, as an aside. Um, so um, everyone likes a white hard hat. Um, so this, again, these are the online resources. So I'll share this with you all and get that to you. Um, another plug for that. Let me pull up my Project Red slide real quick. Um, any questions while I'm doing this? I know it's, it's about 6.30 now, so I will not be offended if you got to go for a fish fry or whatever. But Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's, the, that's the quick blast overview. Um, but again, so it's important to talk about things using the correct language. Um, so if you're talking about, again, I like to say non-native beings, but I also like to say, you know, invasive species to me means it's on that list, it's on NR40, um, and therefore it's, uh, it has a certain status that way. If, you, if you're talking about stuff that's native to Wisconsin, I just don't use that word invasive. Um, keep it sacred to this particular uh, meaning because it's just really, because I, I, I go and argue with foresters all the time about this and like, no man. Aspen is not an invasive species. Yes, it's very aggressive, but it's an aggressive native. And that means that it's still part of the web of life and it doesn't have the, the advantages of our non-local beings that are coming from Asia, Europe, or New Zealand, or whatever it is. Um, so here's the manual. And uh, what I want to really basically get to is what you're doing is there's three types. You, you know, you're, you're tossing rakes. Um, you can do some wading and fishing or paddling. And that's, all, that's all supported. Um, it's a pretty simple uh, protocol. And you just basically, it's, it's a basic species training that you get. You get a manual full of plants and animals that you're looking at. Um, no, don't do that. Um, and there's a cool little 
you know, so this, the, 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 you know, it's, it's quite, it's, it's pretty narrative. It makes a lot of sense. You just go there and you throw a rake in and you, make, you get a shovel out and you look for stuff. You move on, you do that a few times a year. That's all that's required, but we're trying to expand that in the area. Um, and then, so, you know, here are the list of things that we're really looking for in particular. And now, what's interesting is that some of these in the middle, like yellow floating heart, uh, hydrilla, water hyacinth, Brazilian waterweed, we really, and parrot feather, we don't really have them at all in the state. They're from the aquatics industry and like the pond businesses. So, but if we see them, then it's like red alert, send out the hunter killer drones, you know, kind of stuff. Um, over here, we really don't want to see New Zealand mud snails, but we do see a lot of rusty crayfish, red swamp crayfish. They're pretty common, but we always like to kind of curtail them. And then the wetland plants, very common stuff as well. Um, you know, yeah. Is there instructions for if you do find them, how to dispose of them? Uh, yeah, as far as, and general, generally speaking, um, you know, control, like disposing of them, the general protocol is you just double bag it and put it in the trash. Um, all municipalities should have to take them. There's kind of a special thing about waste response. They're like, they have to, like, maybe they don't normally, but they should take them. They say, well, we don't take vegetative trash. You're like, this is an NR40 regulated species, and therefore they do. It's considered trash. Um, now, when it comes to control, that's a whole different ball of wax, obviously. Yeah. And it's highly varied depending upon size, resources, access, all that. Um, yeah, so there's a, there's a way that you kind of go through, basically there's these forms, and you just basically take photos, you collect some plants, and they get them to the, an expert, they can verify it. Um, and then you share them out. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Now, the, the SWIMS data is kind of a nightmare database. That, 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 that's what I do, is I'll take your data and get it into SWIMS, because I don't want to bother you with that. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's a quick nutshell on Project RED. Um, again, that's the manual, and I'll, I'll include that in the, uh, in the um, uh, the email kind of follow up you guys can kind of log into and I think we're making a video out of all this as well so um, if you are interested in more information about this and doing a, a longer training on the river that's why I'm going to try to plan one of those before too long but I wanted to introduce it as a as a concept and especially if you're already doing wave stuff it's the same team and it syncs up with snapshot day which I do every, pretty much every year I did it at uh, Jersey Lake two years ago um, and so it's the same protocol. It's a statewide kind of invasive species um, look. So, um, yeah, that's that's Project Red. Real quick, like. Um, otherwise, you know, we're we're at our we're at our time. So I want to respect your time here. Um, go back to full screen mode. But um, you know, feel free to get me at uh, Upper Sugar. I will be working through this like through the next couple of months with this with my current job. Um, my new job, I'm going to be uh, working for the uh, Department of Agronomy through UW Extensions. And so I'll be doing this very similar work for EDMAPS trainings and uh, first detection stuff, but statewide. And you guys are statewide because you're in the state. So I'm still happy to continue the liaison between uh, myself and the organization and now with the UW support instead of just a little small nonprofit that's, you know, uh, two hours away. So. Um, any other questions that come up over the course of the of the conversation, or things you want need clarification on? Well, so, how will they reach you when you're no longer at Upper Sugar? Um, you can find just look me up. I'll be at the Rens Weed Science Lab. Um, it's what it's called. What? Rens Weed Science. It's uh, so I'm at Wisconsin. Let me Wisconsin First Detectors Network Coordinator here. So yeah. So this this is the page. Um, so it's Wifton, Wisconsin Forest Detectors and Network Coordinator. Um, if you want, you can write down my personal email address too. It's uh, fruitandforest at gmail.com, like my business. Just all spelled out, fruitandforest at gmail.com. Yeah, so I'm getting some personal cards made too, but they have not arrived yet. So that'll be fun. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks for your attention, guys. I appreciate the, you know, the time and uh, the chance to get rescheduled here um, and get to educate. And um, I remain a partner and ally in this. So. I encourage, you know, every little bit helps. Every little boot brush station you can make is a good move. Um, every time you can train a landowner to give some kind of a dang about the stuff in their backyard, that's a win. Um, you know, it's gonna take all of us working together. And also, I'm an optimist, and only because of that can I continue doing my job with a smile on my face. It's a huge fight, um, but invasive species are considered, like, top three like threats to biodiversity in the world. It's like development, climate change, and invasive species are, they are the factors. And really what's happening is, as humans, we're just mixing the pot more and more and more. And we're also slicing up all the habitat, 
So that creates disturbance, that creates weak scratches. Now, invasives are, they're winners. They are really good at spreading their seed to like far off places. They're usually wind pollinated. They're usually very light seeds. They don't require like a complex, they must be pooped through a parrot kind of you know, pathway. Um, and so as we're making more edges, that just, we're just really increasing our, our, our chances that we're gonna have this happen. Um, so, you know, we're in a really wonderful and intact part of the world out here. I think we're blessed in the, in the coolies and in the, in the Vernon County area to have intact ecosystems and it's gonna be a refugia for our stuff, but we still wanna keep an eye out, especially for those high threat species like Japanese knotweed or things that are getting into our waterways because a little bit of that can be really bad for tourism, really bad for your water quality, can actually affect the, you know, the Right now, we don't have any rules about invasive species on your property as far as like mandating control, but I'm seeing it more and more when things switch hands between corporations, they demand that the thing be taken care of or that they receive a discount because they now have this big, like in uh, Madison, there was this big solar farm going in and they said, well, before we buy this, we wanted to plan to take care of all this knotweed because it's gonna be a real problem otherwise. And so they actually, the, they actually had to do some, some front loading of that work before they sold the land to this, this, this company, so. It's definitely very important stuff, um, and I, every, every little bit helps. So get out there, don't be shy. Um, do no harm also, though, I do, I do say that. You know, you don't want to just indiscriminately kill things. You want to be minimally disturbing of the soil when you can, because you know it's gonna grow right back. It's that same thistle or that same thing in the seed bank, and our native stuff's gonna do a great job eventually, but they, these invasives have that advantage of usually earlier onset of leaves that hang on longer and that high seed production and viability. So um, I wish our stuff was quite as aggressive, and it can be. And so use the tools in your toolbox. You know, if you know you got dogwood that grows well, or you got native plants and forbs that are going to be doing well in that region, look around you and, and use those that are, and the aggressive ones to create some shade and, and take up that space instead of invasive species. And especially when things are, you know, lots of bare dirt, lots of new construction, that's the time to be extra vigilant because contractors bringing in on their treads, on their boots, um, it's just may, might be the blow in. And, you know, if you can do a stitch in time and get something down, They'll save you a lot of work down the road. So thank you for your attention. I appreciate it.